Good evening. Good to see you again. We have about uh, 12 questions altogether. Uh, if I take 10 minutes for one question, that means two hours, right? Uh, I don't know. Uh, let me try my best. Uh, if time is allowed, uh, I can, I can do all of them, but uh, I'm not sure. Uh, let me try my best. Uh, anyway, uh, let's pray first and pray to the Lord that he may bless all of us through this time. Let's pray, pray together. Our dear Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for your wonderful love. When we were in darkness, you loved us, and you came to this world, became a man, appeared as a man, and died on the cross, and shed your precious blood for our sins. And through your own blood, you obtained eternal redemption, and you forgave all of our sins away. We Thank you so much for that. We pray to you that you may be with us in our daily Christian life and teach us every moment, every day, and guide us into the right direction so that we may always follow your word and become obedient children of God. Father, we are the light of the word and the salt of this earth. Teach us what manner of life we should have as born-again Christian, and teach us how we can deliver your word to the world around us. Bless our church and our ministry, and open the door of evangelism more widely, so that we may preach the gospel to more people around us and bring them into Christ and glorify your name. At this time, we are having Q&A time. Bless us and each one of us in this room so that we may understand your word better and apply it into our situation and our Christian life. And follow your word and practice our faith in our daily Christian life and bring glory to your wonderful name. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Okay, uh, we have many good questions. And the first question is, if someone is saved and a month later, a person decide they don't want to live a godly life, going to heaven, if they knowingly decide to stop serving God. So the meaning is very clear, yes. If someone says that he is saved, but a month later the person changes his mind and makes a decision, I don't, want, I don't want to live a godly life, he says. Is that person a true born-again Christian? That's what it means. Going to heaven if they knowingly decide to stop serving God. Will that person go to heaven if that person willfully decide to stop serving God? First of all, we need to understand that it is unnatural to say that a person like this is truly saved. When we read all the scripture together, there is no way to believe that that kind of person is truly saved. It is unnatural that a person is truly saved and later makes the decision to stop serving God. That's not the teaching of the Bible. That is very unnatural. 
he is definitely not a true born again believer. Why don't we turn to Hebrew chapter 3, verse 12 and 14? Hebrew. Chapter 3, verse 12 and 14. It reads, Beware, brethren, lest there be in any of you an evil heart of unbelief in departing from the living God. But exhort one another daily, while it is called today, lest any of you be hardened through the deceitfulness of sin. Here verse 12 says, Beware, brethren, lest there be in any of you an evil heart of unbelief, in departing from the living God. If somebody departs from the living God and makes a decision not to serve God, there is no reason and there is no way to believe that that person is truly saved but not sincere in his faith because it is unnatural. Why don't you remember the power of Jesus in Matthew chapter 13, the power of the sower. Jesus explains about the sea which fell on a stony place. Matthew chapter 13, verse 20. Why don't you go to uh, Matthew chapter 13? You must be busy in finding scripture verses. You have to travel a lot today. Yeah, Matthew chapter 13, verse 18. Here Jesus explains and he gives the interpretation of his parable. Verse 18. Therefore, hear the parable of the sower. When anyone hears the when anyone hears the word of the kingdom and does not understand it, then the wicked one comes and snatches away what was sown in his heart. This is he who received seed by the wayside. But he who received the seed on stony places, this is he who hears the word and immediately, immediately receives it with joy. Yet, he has no root in himself, but endures for only for a while. For when tribulation or persecution arises because of the word, immediately he stumbles. Immediately he stumbles. When you carefully read the parable of the sower of Jesus Christ, one seed fell on wayside, another seed fell on stony place, and another seed fell on thorny place. All of them did not bear fruit. Only the final one, the last one, which fell on good ground, became fruitful. Here Jesus explains a very, very important truth. born again through the incorruptible seed of God, which is the word of God, which contains the life of God. Wayside. Stony place. Seed 
fell on to different grounds. These three different types of ground symbolize three different types of heart of man. Okay? And the seed is symbolized the word of God. Only the seed which fell on good ground became Why don't why don't you put your bookmark here and then go to First Peter, First Peter, chapter one, verse twenty-three. First Peter chapter one, verse twenty-three. Do we have a wireless microphone? Wireless microphone? Yeah, that would be better. Verse 23. Having been born again, not of a corruptible seed, but incorruptible, through the word of God, which lives and abides forever. The Bible tells us very clearly that we have been born again, not of corruptible seed, but incorruptible seed, which is the word of God, which lives and abides forever. Let's stop a moment here and think about the seed. Okay, suppose that you have a a plastic apple seed. Okay, this is a plastic one. If you plant this seed into the ground and wait a month. A year, ten year, hundred years, nothing will happen, right? Because it's plastic. But the genuine apple seed, it contains the life of an apple. There is a mystery of life. If you plant the genuine apple seed into the ground, then you will get a sprout. Then finally, an apple tree, and apple fruit. So in that sense, the seed is symbolized the word of God. How do we get saved? How do we become born again Christian? Through the word of God, through the faith, through the word of God. When we hear the gospel message through the word of God, and when we believe the word, the message of the gospel. Into our heart, it is like that the seed, the word of God, the seed of God is being planted into the ground of our heart. Does it make sense? So there is no way that a person is saved without receiving the word of God. Someone says that he is saved when he saw some kind of vision in his dream. No, 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 no. There is. There is no salvation like that in the Bible. We are not saved through prayer. We are not saved through seeing visions or experiencing miracles or something like that. Only through the Word of God, through faith in the Word of God. Do you hear me? Yes. So, seed is key point. If it is a plastic seed, no life. If this seed is a genuine seed, it contains the true life. That's a key point. Anyway, the word of God is the seed of God. But here in the parable of the sower, the problem is not with the seed, but with the ground. The first ground was wayside. 
Second ground was stony places. And the third ground was thorny places. What does Jesus say about stony place? He says in Matthew chapter 13, verse 21, He has no root in himself, but endures for a little while. For when tribulation and persecution arises because of the word, immediately he stumbles. Immediately he stumbled. Psalm chapter 73, verse 27 read, For indeed, those who are far from you shall perish. You have destroyed all those whose, who desert you for holotary. Psalm 73, verse 27 read, if somebody make a rebellion against God and makes a decision not to follow God, he is making a willful rebellion. He is deserting God. That is being called holotry in the Bible. And there is no reason to believe that that kind of person is truly saved. It is possible that true born-again Christian may stumble in their Christian life and be separated from the fellowship for a certain period of time. But if that person is truly born-again Christian, that person struggles a lot in his heart, find no peace in his life. And sometimes God disciplines them. They are disciplined by God. Then finally, they change their heart, repent, and they will return to God again. So it is natural that true born-again Christian will always follow God's direction, even though they stumble in their Christian life. Yes, there is up and down in our Christian life. Sometimes we fall, but we rise again. The righteous person may fall seven times, but finally he is going to rise again to follow God in his life. So this expression is important, I think. If someone makes a decision not to follow God, not to live a godly life after his profession of faith, there is a big chance that that person is not truly saved. And that is the main reason why that person makes that kind of decisions. Okay? Number two, what does the scripture say about stopping bad habit to get closer to Christ? If you carefully read the scripture, it's hard to find specific passages regarding habits. Maybe it is because people in ancient days, they didn't have that kind of problem. But today we do have all different kinds of bad habit problem, addiction. Bad addiction. So many people around us, they are addicted to alcohol, cigarettes, gambling, computer game, bad things, all kinds of bad things surround us. So it is very easy that we may fall into some kind of bad habits. That is not a desirable case, but that is true. It is, it is very, very hard to fix our life and lead our life into the right directions. There is an interesting story that somebody makes a decision not to eat donuts every morning. That person was eating donut every morning, okay? 
on the way to go to his workplace, he always stopped by a donut shop and get one donut and coffee. He is getting bigger and bigger and bigger. Obesity was his problem. So that person makes a decision. I'm not going to eat donut ev next morning, OK? I will stop it. Then he says, I'm not going to stop by a donut shop if the parking lot is full, OK? If there is a space for parking lot, then I may stop there. But if the parking lot is full, then I'm not going to stop by. He makes a decision. He makes his own rule. Next morning, he is passing by the donut shop. And the parking lot was full. You know what he did? He turned around the donut shop until one vacant space is found. Three minutes later, one car left the parking lot and he found his space. And he stopped by the donut shop. Funny story, but anyway. What does this story teach to us? It's very, very hard for us, for all of us, to stop bad habit. Proverbs chapter 26, verse 14 read, As a door turns on its hinge, so does the lazy man on his bed. Yes, it literally means that. A lazy man has a problem to get up quickly from the bed. It's like a door turns on the hinge. The lazy man does on his bed. And I personally believe that it may also describe our bad habit. We are addicted to something today. So many people in our generation, we are addicted to something. And it's very, very hard to quit it. Proverbs chapter 26, verse 11 says, As a dog returned to his own vomit, so a fool repeats his folly. His folly. Yes. If somebody repeats bad things again and again, this is what the scripture says. As a dog returns to his own vomit, so a fool repeats his folly. It may be applied to everyone's case. We are doing silly things again and again. We are repeating bad habit. Proverbs chapter 13, verse 19 read, It is an abomination to fools to depart from evil. Yes, in some sense, people, they do not want to depart from evil. That's the main reason why they have hard time and, and they have problem to quit from bad habits. Addicted. Addiction, that is a, a very, very common, prominent problem of today's generations. So if you believe that you are addicted to something bad, then you need to pray to the Lord that he may change your heart so that you may make up your mind and practice it into your life. Everything will be done through God's help. Philippians chapter 4, verse 13. Let's go to Philippians. Chapter 4, verse 13. Paul says here, I can do all things through Christ who strengthened me. I can do all things through Christ who strengthened me. All things here include stopping bad things. So if you just try to stop it with your own power, you may not do it. 
Sometimes it's very, very hard to do that. You need God's help. Therefore, first, you need to kneel down before God and pray to the Lord that He may help you to stop that bad habit. Make up your mind. It's totally up to you. No one takes your place. You have to make a decision and you have to practice it. It is your job. But you may do that through Christ who strengthens you. So let's believe that we can do all things through Christ who strengthens us. It will be done through the power of Jesus Christ when He truly helps you. He knows our weakness. He knows that we are not strong. Therefore, He is ready to help us. Hebrews chapter 4 Hebrews chapter 4, verse 15 and 16. Fifteen and sixteen. Hebrews chapter 4, verse 15 and 16. For we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses, but was in all points tempted as we are, yet without sin. Let us therefore come boldly to the throne of grace, that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in times of need. Sometimes we feel that we are not able to stop bad things. I cannot stop my bad habit. I am repeating again and again because I am sinful. But that's not a desirable case. In Christian life, God doesn't like that. God is not pleased to see that his believers, Christians, are repeating bad habits. God doesn't want that. Therefore, he wants us to stop it and to change our mind and our hearts and change our lifestyle. Absolutely. But that will be done through the power of God. When we truly understand our weaknesses and confess our sins and cry out for help of God. The Bible says that if we, if we confess our sins, God is still faithful. Therefore, He is going to forgive us again. What a wonderful promise it is. Here, verse 15 says, He knows our infirmity. He sympathizing with our weaknesses. Our weaknesses. It includes everything which is not desirable in God's eyes. Our mistakes, bad habits, and everything. Those are our weaknesses. God says that He is sympathizing with our weaknesses and in all points, He too, He was tempted, but Jesus Christ, He overcame all the temptation. He was without sin. Therefore, He is ready to help us. Verse 16 says, Let us therefore come boldly to the throne of grace, that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. Jesus Christ is sitting at the throne of grace, and He is ready to help His believers. He is sympathizing with our weaknesses, and He is ready to help us. Therefore, let us have boldness in our heart and go to his throne and ask 
and cry out for help. That's what it means. So if you think that you have bad habit in your life, then you need to first understand that you are weak. Therefore, you need to confess your weaknesses. Then ask for help, for God's help. Go to his throne, confess your sins, and ask him to help you to stop that bad habit. And he is going to help you. Romans chapter 12 tells us that we shouldn't be conformed to this world, but be transformed by renewing of our heart. Romans chapter 12. Let's go to Romans chapter 12, verse 2. And do not be conformed to this word, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Do not be conformed, but be transformed. Here, two different words are found, conform and transform. We know what it means. Conform means having same form with the word. But transform, it means that change our form. Okay? Do not be conformed to this word, but be transformed. Transforming power. Holy Spirit gives us a transforming power in our life. We may transform our lifestyle through His power, not just through our own power, but His power. Therefore, we may go to the throne of God and ask His help so that He may walk with you and change your lifestyle, transform your lifestyle. Remember that Romans chapter 12 was given to the born-again believers. It was not given to the non-believers. So all of us, we must be transformed day by day, every day, so that we may become more mature Christians. Number three, how are we supposed to treat those who claim they are saved, but their word and actions indicate differently? Good questions. This question is related with the first question. There are some people who profess their faith but do not behave like true Christians. Then, how are we supposed to treat them? Absolutely, we should not condemn them because God desires all men to be saved. God loves the world. And he desires all people to know Jesus Christ as their personal Savior and get saved. God loves all people. Therefore, we should not condemn them. But it is natural for Christians to feel badly when we see that kind of person. 1 John chapter 4, verse 1 read, Do not believe every spirit, but test the spirit, whether they are of God. It means that we should discern what is right and what is wrong. Who is true born-again Christian and who is not. Even though we are not perfect, only God knows who is truly saved born-again Christian and who is not. But it is true that we too, we have some kind of ability to discern between true believer and false believer. That's the reason why this kind of scripture passages is given to us. Do not believe every spirit, 
but test the spirit and understand whether they are of God or not. So when we see that kind of person, it is inevitable in some sense not to judge that kind of person inside. But we should not condemn them. James chapter 2 verse 14 and 20 read. Why don't we go to James chapter 2 verse 14. Book of James chapter 2 verse 14. This is talking about the topic that we are dealing with today. James chapter 2 verse 14. What does it profit, my brethren, if someone says he has faith but does not have works? Can faith save him? Verse 17. Does also faith by itself, if it does not have works, is dead. But someone will say, you have faith and I, and I have works. Show me your faith without your works. And I will show you my faith by my works. You believe that there is one God? You do well. Even the demons believe and tremble. Tremble. But... Do you want to know, O foolish man, that faith without work is dead? Here is a, a very, very important topic is being dealt with. Faith without works. Yes, it sounds unnatural. Because the Bible teaches us very clearly that faith works always with Proof, faith and works, balanced. But if someone says that he is born again Christian, he is professing his faith in Christ, but he has no work as a Christian at all, then how can we believe that that, kind of, that person is truly saved? There is no way for us to believe that that person is truly born again Christian. Those who claim they are saved, but their word and actions indicate differently. We need to understand first that no one is perfect. But this is a different case. If someone professes faith in Christ, but does not behave at all as true born-again Christians. So many American people in America, they say that they are Christian. They believe in God's existence. They believe in Christ's redemption. They are Christian, but they go to church only two times a year, Easter Sunday and Christmas Eve. Okay? But they still profess that they are Christians. They believe that they believe in rapture, second coming of Jesus Christ, tribulation time, and everything. They say, yeah, I know, I believe, I believe everything. But they do not practice their true faith in their life. Then how can we know that that kind of person is truly saved and truly born again Christian? There is no way. You need to remember that Book of James here is not emphasizing the works as a condition of salvation. But rather than that, the book of James is, is the book which is emphasizing the faith, not works. Then what does it mean? If someone claims that he is a born-again Christian but have no works, then there is no way for us to believe that person is truly born-again Christian because that person is just professing his faith and is not showing true genuine works. But if he is a, a truly born-again Christian, 
God knows them. But we are not God. Okay? God knows every person perfectly. So he knows who is truly saved and who is not truly saved. But we are not God. To us, how do we know that somebody is truly born again Christian? If somebody professes faith in Christ and shows a good behavior as a Christian, balanced, his word, testimony, profession, and his lifestyle, his walks, balanced together, then we know from the human standpoint, aha, uh -huh, that person is truly born again Christian. Do you understand? Yes, that's what it means. Therefore, from our human standpoint, there is no way for us to believe that this kind of person who is professing faith in Christ but is not practicing his faith in his life, is not showing good works, there is no reason for us to believe that that kind of person is truly saved. First John chapter 1 verse 7 says, We have fellowship with one another if we walk in the life. The first John tells us the fellowship between God and the believers. And the fellowship between believers. First, if we walk in the light, then we have fellowship with our Father. If we have good fellowship with our Father, then we will have good fellowship with one another. But if somebody claims that he is a born-again Christian, but he is not walking in the light, he is not enjoying, he is not having good fellowship with God, he lives like an like a unsaved guy, secular people, non-believer behave badly, speak very badly, does not show any Christian fruit, but he's just professing his faith, then how can we have fellowship with that guy? That's what it means. Therefore, it says, we have fellowship with one another if we walk in the light. Our church is not just social gathering. Some churches is like a social gathering. It's becoming like a social gathering. People just, they just love to gather together. Hundreds of people, thousands of people, mega churches, gather together. But they are not interested in the Word of God. They are interested in something else. Just getting together, hanging out together. Some people, they just love to gather together and sing together. But they are not interested in the true message of the gospel. So many churches around us are becoming charismatic. People, they are, they are looking for wonders, signs, healings, seeing visions and something like that. Therefore, so many churches around us, okay, they like short sermon, 15-minute, 20-minute condensed format of sermon, and one hour and one and a half hour music time. I'm not saying that music is the bad thing. No, 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 no. Don't get me wrong. But people they do not endure long sermon. Why? Because it is too long? I don't think so. Because they don't like to hear the Word of God. They are not interested in the Word of God. So our sermons in our American churches are getting shorter and shorter and shorter. At the time of D.L. Moody and Jonathan Edward, the average sermon time on Sunday morning in American churches were two hours and two and a half hours, people say. Sometimes one and a half hour. It depends on each church. But today, 
The sermon time is getting shorter and shorter and shorter. Today, 30 minutes, 20 minutes, 15 minutes. It is technically impossible and very, very hard for the preachers to deliver a good message just in 10 minutes and 15 minutes, 20 minute sermon. No, too short. Because we have a lot of things to learn. Okay? First Peter chapter 2, verse 4 and 6. First Peter, uh, first John, I'm sorry, excuse me. First John chapter 2, verse 4. Chapter 2, verse 3. 3 through 5. Let me read. 1 John chapter 2, verse 3 through 5. Now by this we know that we know him, if we keep his commandments. He who says, I know him, and does not keep his commandment, is a liar, and the truth is not in him. But whoever keeps his word, the word of God, truly love God, love of God is perfected in him. By this we know that we are in him. Okay? He who says, I know him, and does not keep his commandment, is a liar. And the truth is not in him. What does it mean? Same case. If somebody professes faith in Christ, but does not practice his faith at all, showing no works in his Christian life, he is a liar. The truth is not in him. But, verse 5, whoever keeps his word, which means that obey the word of God, practice the word of God in his life, truly the love of God is perfected in him. By this, we know that we are in Him. 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 26. In that verse, Paul says that he was experiencing the danger from false brothers. The danger from false brothers. What kind of danger is that? In the church of God, there are two different kinds of believers, true born-again Christian and false believers. False believers, they may profess their faith, but they are not truly saved. They are associated with born-again Christian. Therefore, Paul says that he was in danger from false brothers. We need to discern So it is unnatural that somebody profess his faith in Christ but shows no walks of Christians. Remember that Jesus said one time, good tree bears good fruit. Good tree cannot bear bad fruit. Bad tree cannot bear good fruits. Jesus was not talking about apple tree or peach tree. But he was talking about believer. If somebody is a, a true born-again believer, he is a good tree. He is like a good tree. Then he is going to bear the suitable, right Christian fruits. Walks. That's what he means. So if somebody professes faith in Christ but does not bear Christian fruit, it doesn't make sense. Question number four.
Let's do uh, question number five first and then go to number four. Let's manage our time. Question number five, can you recommend a Bible study method? Wow, very difficult questions. If you are a new believer, you may read the book of Romans and the Gospel of John first. That is the most recommendable. Very important two books in your Christian journey. So read the book of Romans and Gospel of John. And then you may read New Testament Bible first, and then read Old Testament Bible. That is easier way to understand the whole picture of the Bible. If you are a new believer, please remember, Book of Romans and the Gospel of John are the most important books among New Testament books. Then read 27 books of New Testament. After you finish reading New Testament, then you read Old Testament. Read Book of Romans and Gospel of John at least three times. Then read New Testament Bible at least three times. Then read Old Testament Bible. That is recommendable. And when you read the Bible, you may start with prayer, absolutely. The Bible is different from any other book in the world. It is the Word of God. So before you read your Bible, you may pray first and read, try to read carefully and thoroughly. Okay. Doing a topical Bible study is not recommendable for the new believer. For the pastors and Bible teachers, topical Bible study, absolutely, require and recommendable. But for lay people, you may just read through from the beginning to the end. That's the best way. Sometimes you may take one Bible for one week. What it means is that you take Gospel of John and you may finish it during one week. Okay? From Monday through Saturday, you may repeat the Gospel of John again and again, again and again. That's very good. Even though you are following Bible reading plan, do you have your Bible reading plan? Okay? You may follow it, but you may pick one Bible, for example, Book of John or Gospel of John or Gospel of Luke or Book of Romans, something like that, and read thoroughly during the whole week. That would be very good. And also, I'd like to recommend you to write down what you, what you get from reading the Bible. Pick a note, good note and good pencil, and write down what you understand when you read the Bible. That is a very, very important habit. Try to summarize what you read. And that would be very, very helpful. You need to build a habit to make a plan. There is no specific method, but you may build your own method. To do that, why don't you try your best to build a habit? For example, the person I know she wakes up early in the morning, around 5 o'clock in the morning. She always opens up her Bible every morning for two hours after prayer. She is an old lady. At night time, she says that she does not read the Bible because she is getting sleepy too fast. So she goes to bed early. But early in the morning, she wakes up and reads the Bible every morning. If you are a student and if you get up late, pretty late, it's, it's not going to be easy for you to, to read the Bible early in the morning. 
So the best time for you may be after school, after you came back from your school. Maybe 3 o'clock in the afternoon or 4 o'clock in the afternoon. It depends on each person. Or when you come back home from your workplace, you may start reading the Bible. Spend one hour a day, something like that. At least three to four chapters a day you may read. Then you will finish the whole Bible in a year. Build your habit. Okay? Take a certain time, the best time for you. And try to build and try to read the Bible every day, every day. Then if you repeat it three weeks, then you will become your habit. It will become your habit. Scholars say that if we repeat something consecutively 21 days, three weeks, then it will become our habit. So if you want to build your habit, Bible reading habit, you may designate the best time for you and repeat it three weeks. Then it will become your habit. And also I'd like to recommend you to memorize important verses. Are you memorizing scripture verses? Okay. We have recommendable memorizing verses on our church bulletin, right? Every weekly bulletin. Okay. Try to memorize all of them thoroughly every week. That would be very, very helpful. Memorize scripture verses. And also you may use some tools like Bible handbook, dictionary, or sometimes study Bible. Do you have Bible handbook? The traditional well-known Bible handbook is Holly's Bible handbook and Henrietta Mears. She was a Bible teacher in California, well-known Sunday school teacher, Henrietta Mears. She was a woman, but she wrote a very, very excellent Bible dictionary and Bible handbook. Henrietta Mears. And Bible dictionaries. There are many important terminologies and expressions in the Bible. Important word. And we have hard time to understand what it means. Therefore, we need Bible dictionaries. Good Bible dictionaries. Sometimes we may get it from the internet, but paper one is much, much better. Buy a Bible dictionary and Bible handbook, and it will be very, very helpful to study the Bible. And we have study Bible. If you go to bookstore, there are many kinds of study Bible, okay? But you need to you need to find a good one, okay? Because it is not that all of them are good study Bible. Try to find a good study Bible, Bible handbook, and Bible dictionaries. They may become useful tool to read the Bible. And today, we may get a lot of good information from the internet. But you need to find a good website. Not every website is good. Okay? Therefore, you need to be very, very careful to, to choose a very good website. And, and find online Bible dictionary, online Bible handbook, and something like that. And the most important thing is that you need to build your own habit to study the Bible. And also, you may try your best to read the Bible thoroughly. Try to read it carefully, okay? Do not read the Bible like a novel, okay? Shh. No, 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 no. Try to 
read carefully. And also, meditation is very important. It means that you need to read it very carefully again and again, again and again. Suppose that you go to a museum. How do you take tour? Okay? The first way, you may make a quick trip from the entrance. Make a short and quick trip. It's okay. It's possible. Then you go home, but you do not remember what you saw. Right? Meditation is like this. You make a... Sh make a trip in the museum and stand before one object and look at it very carefully. Look at it from this side, from this side, from this side, from everywhere. Look at it again and again very carefully. And read the description. Take a picture. Think about it. That is a meditation. So it is okay to read, for example, to, to read the Gospel of John from the first to the, the last chapter quickly, consecutively. It's okay. But the meditation is to read carefully again and again. That is very, very useful. When you read it carefully and meditate on it, then God will teach you more deeply. Book of Psalm, chapter 1. Let's read the book of Psalm, chapter 1, and then take a break time. Psalm, chapter 1. Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor stand in the path of sinners, nor sits in the seat of the counsel, the scornful. But his delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law he meditates day and night. His delight is in the law of the Lord, the word of God. And in his law, he meditates day and night. Meditates. Meditation is a very, very useful thing. That is reading and pondering upon that verse, upon certain verses of the Bible, upon certain books of the Bible, or upon certain chapters of the Bible, and Read it thoroughly again and again, repeatedly, and get lessons from meditation. And then you may write down what you learn from the meditation. Okay? There is no specific Bible study method, but why don't you make your own method? Build up your own style. And the key point is that repeat it every day. That's the key point. If you just do it one week and then stop it, useless many times. Okay? But if you keep it doing it again and again consecutively for a whole year, that will become your own habit. That's going to be very, very useful. Okay? We have about uh, 30 to 40 minutes to go. Okay? And we have many questions. Question number four. How are, to, are we to interpret Hebrew chapter 6, verse 4 and 6? Let's go to Hebrew chapter, four, or chapter 6. Hebrew chapter 6, verse 4 through 6. Let me read. The question is, how can we interpret verse 4? Through six. For it is impossible for those who were once enlightened and have tested the heavenly gift 
and have become partakers of the Holy Spirit and have tested the good word of God and the power of the age to come. If they fall away, to renew them again to repentance, since they crucify again for themselves the Son of God and put him to an open shame. Who are they and what are they doing? What is the meaning of these passages? The basic meaning is that it is impossible to renew them again to repentance since they crucify again for themselves the Son of God and put him to an open shame. It is impossible to renew them Who are they? Verse 4 and 5 says, They were once enlightened. They have tested and tasted the heavenly gift. And they have become partakers of the Holy Spirit. And they have tasted the good word of God and the power of the age to come. But, verse 6 says, They fall away. Are they born again Christian or not? They are not born again Christian, absolutely not. They are not true believers. Therefore, it says that it is impossible to renew them again to repentance. And they are crucifying Jesus Christ, the Son of God, again. It means that they are rejecting him. And putting him, putting Jesus to an open shame. So many people question about these passages because it sounds like that these passages is teaching a theory that if somebody becomes a born-again Christian, then lose his salvation, fall away, depart from the right way and then if that person d does that it is impossible that that person to make a true repentance and come back to salvation that person is permanently lost but that's not what it means when we read the whole scripture it is very very clear to believe that true born-again believer cannot lose the salvation because we are eternally secure in the blood of Jesus Christ. Our salvation is eternal salvation and eternal redemption. Therefore, true born-again Christians cannot lose their salvation. They are 100% guaranteed in the blood of Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ said in John chapter 10 verse 28, I give them eternal life, they shall never perish. They shall never perish because they are given eternal life. So, this case, what is found here in verse 4 through 6, it is not the case of born-again Christian who can not lose their salvation. Then, who are they? Who are they who have tasted the heavenly gift, who were once enlightened, who have become partakers of the Holy Spirit, and who have tasted the good word of God, then fall away. You need to understand this. Even these people were once enlightened, have tasted the heavenly gift, and have become partakers of the Holy Spirit. They are not true born-again believers. Is it possible that some people, somebody is enlightened and 
has tasted the heavenly gift and has become partakers of, partakers of the Holy Spirit and have tasted the word of God and is not still saved? Absolutely. You need to understand the context of this passage. Similar passages is found in chapter 10, Hebrew. Chapter 10, Hebrew, verse 26. Let's go to Hebrew chapter, chapter 10, verse 26. For if we sin willfully after we have received the knowledge of the truth, there no longer remain a sacrifice for sins, but a certain fearful expectation of judgment and fiery, fiery indignation which will devour the adversaries. Anyone who has rejected Moses' law dies without mercy on the testimony of two or three witnesses. Of how much worse punishment do you suppose? Will he be thought worthy who has trampled the Son of God underfoot, counted the blood of the covenant by which he was sanctified a common thing, was and inserted the spirit of grace. Who are they and what are they doing? You need to understand that the Hebrew chapter 4, verse 4 through 6, and these verses, Hebrew chapter 10, verse 26 through 28, both of them are dealing with same group of people, same, same thing. We need to understand first, when we read the book of Hebrew, that there were different group of audience at the time. Book of Hebrew, it was the letter given to the Hebrew people. Among them, some of them have already become born again Christian, but some of them, they were exposed to the gospel message. They heard the word of God, but they were not in true born again faith. Why don't we go to uh, Acts chapter 21st. Uh, let, me, let me give you some background of it and then explain what happened at the time. Acts chapter 21st, verse 20. At that time, in the early church age, there were many Jewish people who were truly saved and truly born again. And also, there were many Jewish people, many Hebrew, who were not truly saved, even though they had been exposed to the gospel message. Chapter 21, verse 20. And when they heard it, they glorified the Lord, and they said to him, You see, brother, how many myriad of Jews there are who have believed, and they are all jealous for the law. But they have been informed about you, that you teach all the Jews who are among the Gentiles to forsake Moses, saying that they ought not to circumcise their children nor to walk according to the customs. What then? The assembly must certainly meet, for they will hear that you have come. Therefore, do what we tell you. Let me explain what is going on here. And right at the time, as verse 20 says, many myriad of Jews there are who have believed and they are all jealous for the law. Here it says they believed.
But that does not mean that they are truly 100% born again Christian. They receive the preachings of the of the apostles. They heard the gospel message. They accepted well, but still they were struggling because they were not 100% born again. Among the audience of the book of Hebrew, there were some Jewish people and many Jewish people who were intellectually convinced of the gospel because they were exposed to the gospel. They heard the gospel. In that sense, they were enlightened. They were enlightened and they have tasted the power of the Holy Spirit in that sense. And they were attracted by the gospel of Jesus Christ, but they had reached no finer conviction of faith. They had heard about Jesus Christ and his salvation, but they were still struggling between keeping the law and receiving Jesus Christ as a finer and full source of their salvation. So verse 20 says, Many myriad of Jews there are, but they are all jealous, jealous for the law. So many Jewish people at the time, they thought that they were supposed to keep the law according to the teaching of Moses. Okay? So the latter, the book of Hebrew, was written to give them a clear teaching about the salvation and the encouragement and also 100% confidence in Christ Jesus. They were enlightened because they were exposed to the gospel. They were given chance to hear the gospel. In that sense, they tasted the power of the Holy Spirit together. They were struggling between eternal redemption and keeping the law of Moses. Okay. Man is justified not by keeping the law, but by, by faith in Christ Jesus, as we know well. Okay. But so many Jewish people at the time they still believed that they had to keep the law of Moses so that they may be accepted by the Lord. That was their problem. Romans chapter 10. Why don't you go to Romans chapter 10? Verse 1 through 2. Brethren, Romans chapter 10, verse 1 and 2. Brethren, my heart's desire and prayer to God for Israel is that, that they may, sa that they may be saved. For I bear them witness that they have a zeal for God, but not according to knowledge. For they being ignorant of God's righteousness and seeking to establish their own righteousness have not submitted the righteousness of God. For Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone who believes. Okay? Right at the time, so many Jewish people at the time of Apostle Paul they try to establish their own righteousness. And they were ignorant of God's righteousness. These people they try to establish their own righteousness. 
by keeping the law of Moses, keeping all the commandment and regulation commanded by Moses. In that sense, they were jealous for the law of Moses. Okay? They tried to establish their own righteousness without knowing God's righteousness. What is God's righteousness? That is opposite concept. Do you remember the story of Cain and Abel? Cain belongs to the first group. And so many people today, they belong to the group of Cain. They try to establish their own righteousness and try to be approved by God. They are religious. They are jealous for the law of God. So many Christians, so-called Christians of today, they say that they have to keep the Ten Commandments. They, try, they have to try their best to live a good life, to become a good person, so that they can go to heaven. They are misunderstanding the basic concept of God's salvation. Their purport says, I bear them witness that they have a zeal for God, but not according to knowledge. For they, being ignorant of God's righteousness, and seeking to establish their own righteousness. God's righteousness is coming down from heaven to us. God become a man. He appears as a man. And he fulfills all the law of God. And he dies on the cross, becomes our righteousness. Jesus Christ, he is our righteousness. When we believe him, when we believe him, he saves us. That is God's righteousness. Abel, through faith, he became righteous. Cain, why don't you remember and understand the difference between Cain and Abel? The difference between man's righteousness and God's righteousness. So, so many Jewish people at the time, they were jealous for God's business. They were jealous for the law of Moses. They tried to establish their own righteousness, but they were ignorant of God's righteousness. Therefore, let's go to uh, Hebrew chapter, chapter 6. Hebrew. Can anybody turn the heater off? Yeah. Hebrew chapter 6, verse 4. For it is impossible for those, for those who were once enlightened, Jewish people who heard the gospel message, but had not perfectly come to the finer assurance of salvation. In that sense, they were struggling between two things. They were once enlightened and have tasted the heavenly gift and have become partakers of the Holy Spirit. Suppose what happened to, to the 5,000 people who was fed by Jesus Christ. Do you remember what happened to Israeli people at the time of Jesus? Jesus, with five bread and two fish, Jesus Christ, he fed 5,000 people. So many people, they saw the miracle of God. In that sense, they tasted the heavenly gift. They tasted 
the power of the Holy Spirit. They were enlightened. But it does not mean that all of them, all 5,000 people got saved. No, 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 no. They just saw the miracle of God. But many of them, they left. They were not true followers of Jesus Christ. So many people at the time of Jesus, they saw the miracles of Jesus. Do you remember the story of Lazarus? Lazarus became 100% dead. But after four days later, Jesus was visiting his own and then made Lazarus live again. It was an amazing miracle. So many people in that house, they saw what was happening through the power of Jesus Christ. They saw the miracle of God. In that sense, they were enlightened. They have tasted, tasted the heavenly gift. And they have become partakers of the Holy Spirit. Do you understand? But it does, not, it does not mean that all of them who were there at the time, every single of them got saved and became truly saved. No, 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 no. That does not mean that. Likewise, so many Jewish people at the time, there were many myriad of Jews who have believed. They are all jealous for the law, not for the gospel. They were, they were jealous for the law, the law of Moses. But they were not true born-again believers. Then, verse 6, if they fall away to renew them again to repentance, since they crucify again for themselves the Son of God and put him to an open shame. So some people, they hear the gospel. In that sense, they are exposed to the gospel. They are enlightened. They taste the heavenly gift. And they become partakers of the Holy Spirit. But finally, if they do not receive Jesus Christ as their personal Savior, truly in their heart and not saved, then they are falling away. They are falling away. It's like they, they are crucifying Jesus again on the cross of Calvary. Because they hear the gospel, but they reject the gospel. If somebody rejects the gospel, that person is crucifying Jesus again on the cross. That's what it means. Wow. It sounds very terrible and horrible, right? If somebody denies the gospel, if somebody rejects the gospel, that person is crucifying Jesus on the cross. So many people of today, they are hearing the gospel message. But it does not necessarily mean that all of them and every single of them are truly born again Christian. It is so sad that so many people hear the gospel today, but they still do not believe truly. Finally, they will fall away. Therefore, they makes decision they make decision not to believe in God not to serve God not to follow Jesus they fall away that is the reason why Jesus said enter by the narrow gate because narrow is the gate which lead to life to heaven but wide is the gate which lead to destruction. There are many people who claim that they are Christian, who are calling the name of Jesus Christ as their Lord, but still lost. So, so many people will come to Jesus on the final day and they will say to Jesus, Lord, have we not prophesied in your name? 
Have we not done wonders in your name? Perform miracles in your name? But Jesus speaks to them. I never knew you. Depart from me, you who protect, who, who practice lawlessness. They have done so many wonders, miracles, and sometimes perform wonderful things. And they claim themselves as prophets of God, but they were not true born-again Christians. Wow. So, we may think about this verse very carefully. It may be applied to us. We too. We are hearing the gospel message in our church. We know what the gospel is. We know who Jesus is. But if we say that we believe in Jesus... But finally, we fall away. That means that we are crucifying Jesus on the cross again. And there is no way for forgiveness in that case. If somebody hears the gospel, but finally rejects it. He hears the gospel, but falls away finally. If he falls away then there is no reason to believe that that person is truly saved. That's what it means. So we should not commit this kind of horrible sin, crucifying Jesus again on the cross and putting Jesus to an open shame. That is an unpardonable sin. That is blaspheming Holy Spirit. That's what Jesus said. If somebody blasphemed the Holy Spirit, that person and that kind of sin is not pardonable. What is unpardonable sins? Rejecting Jesus Christ finally. Falling away finally. That is blaspheming Jesus because they are crucifying Jesus again on the cross. That's what it means. So you, we need to understand this. Among the audience of the book of Hebrew, there were true born-again Christians. And there were a certain group of Christians who heard the gospel, who were enlightened, who were given chance to hear the gospel, but who did not finally come to the assurance of faith. They were intellectually convinced, in some sense, and they were attracted by the gospel, but they did not come to the full assurance of faith. They are not true born-again Christians. So why don't you remember that there were two different groups of audience among the recipients of the, the book of Hebrew? Okay? And question number seven. I'm sorry. Question number six. Where is six? Three and four. I'm getting old. My eyesight. Hmm. I can find question number six. Three. Okay. Later, we can do it. First Corinthians chapter 14, verse 35 and 30, uh, 34 and 35, and verse 40 says that women should be silent in the churches 
and not speak, but should ask their husband at home. Verse 40 also says that everything should be done in a decent and orderly way. What does order in the church mean? Okay. 1 Corinthians chapter 14. Let's go to 1 Corinthians chapter 14. First Corinthians chapter 14, verse First Corinthians chapter 14, verse 35. Let your women keep silent in the churches, for they are not permitted to speak, but they are to be submit submissive as the law also says. And if they want to learn something, let them ask their husband, own husband at home, for it is shameful for women to speak in church. Then verse 40, let all things be done decently and in order. What does order in the church mean? Absolutely. There is an order in the church. Some churches of today, they have women pastors. Some Methodist church, some Presbyterian churches, and Anglican churches. Churches of today are seeing big changes. Is it okay to have women pastor? Our church, we don't do that. Why? What is the main reason? People say that we are living in modern days. We should not follow the old ways. Everything is possible today because we are living in modern times. So is it okay to, to have a woman pastor? But that's not the teaching of the Bible. When we carefully read the Bible, let's go to 1 Timothy chapter 2. Let's go to 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 11. 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 11 and 15. Let a woman learn in silence with all submission, and I do not permit a woman to teach or to have authority over a man, but to be in silence. For Adam was formed first, then Eve. And Adam was not deceived, but the woman, being deceived, fell into transgression. Nevertheless, she will be saved in childbearing if they continue in faith and love and holiness and self-control. Here, verse 11 and 12 says, Let a woman learn in silence with all submission, and I do not permit a woman to teach or to have authority over a man, but to be in silence. So here is the question. Some people interpret this passage like this. These passages 
It was written 2,000 years ago in ancient days. But today, we are seeing the change of women's rights. Our society has changed. Everything has changed. Therefore, this kind of rule should be changed. Women should be in submission. Wow, that's an old way. We're not going to follow that. That's an old traditional lifestyle. Why should women be submissive to men? Doesn't make sense. That's what they say. But you need to understand this. This is, this is not talking about the culture. This is not talking about the tradition. But this is the creation order. The principle that God set at the time of his creation. Verse 13. For Adam was formed first, then Eve. And Adam was not deceived, but the woman being deceived fell into transgression. So why don't you read carefully verse, from verse 11 through 14. Let a woman learn in silence. Verse 12 says, I do not permit a woman to teach or to have authority over a man. Why? Verse 13 says, For, because Adam was formed first, then Eve. This is talking about the creation order. It says that it is because man was created first, then the woman later. There is a difference between man and woman. Okay? Scripture says that man was created first, then woman. Therefore, 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 8 says, For man is not from woman, but woman from man. Nor was man created for the woman, but woman for the man. For this reason, the woman ought to have a symbol of authority on her head. That's what it means in, in public service. Man is not from the woman, but woman from the man. Nor was man created for the woman, but woman for the man. So we, when we combine these two verses, 1 Timothy chapter 2 and 1 Corinthians chapter 11, it means that there are differences between man and woman. First, in creation order. Second, in creation purpose. Okay? First, creation order. Man is created first, then woman later. Who was first? Man first. God created woman as a helper for man. Helper. God did not, did not create man as a helper for woman. But he created woman as a helper for man. Creation purpose was different. That's what he means. Therefore... I do not permit a woman to teach or have authority over man. That's what he means. This is talking about the creation order, not a culture thing. This is what we believe from the scripture. This is the reason why in our church, women cannot become pastors. And women cannot become elders. Pastors and elders, they are in authority position. Okay? Overseeing the church and ruling over the church with God's authority. This is talking about authority. This is a very, very important concept. So, Bible does not permit women to teach in public service. In Sunday school, women teachers may, may teach children. It is okay. But this is, this is talking about in general. Women are not able to teach in public service over men. They should not exercise authority over men. They should not become elders. 
but they may become deacons, different position. Okay, got it? So it is so sad that so many churches of today, they are changing a lot, everything. Methodist church, Presbyterian churches, and some modern churches with modern style, with modern services, they are changing everything. But they are breaking the law of God. That's not proper way. That is wrong. Okay, another question. Because time is limited, let me speed up a little bit. How should one evangelize to opposite sex? When you try to evangelize the opposite sex, you must be very careful. Because the scripture says in 1 Timothy chapter 5, verse 2, that a younger woman uh, treat a younger woman as sisters with absolute purity. So when men try to evangelize women, there is a chance that the temptation is involved. We must be very careful. So we should treat young women as sisters, like sisters, that's what it means, with absolute purity. It is okay to evangelize opposite sex. Scripture does not prohibit it. But we must be very careful. Ephesians chapter 4 verse 27 says, Do not give the devil a foothold. Do not give the devil an opportunity. New American Standard Version renders it. So, in every case, in every situation, we must be... We must be very, very careful not to give the chance to the devil so that we may fall into temptation. So we must maintain absolute purity between men and women. How can unmarried people choose a spouse? And how can unmarried people have a successful family life? The teachings of the Bible is very clear. Born-again Christian should marry born-again Christians. Do not be unequally yoked together with unbelievers. 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 14, read. For what fellowship has righteousness with lawlessness? What communion has light with darkness? And what accord has Christ with Belial? And what part has a believer with an unbeliever? That's what scripture says. Therefore, Christians, they should Christian, they should marry born-again Christian. If born-again Christian marries non-believer, that is not right before God's eye. That is disobedience. God is not pleased to see that. Christians marries Christian. Beautiful picture. Then they should love with one, with one another, with Christ's love. Be submissive to one another. Try to become one by serving Jesus Christ as their master at home. Then they will have successful marriage. No divorcement. Divorcement is, is, is not allowed in the Bible. That's not the desirable way of God, even though it is happening around us. But that's not a desirable case. No separation. Husband and wife, they should love each other. They should honor each other with Christ's love. Sacrifice is required. It's not easy to maintain good relationship. Be patient and show Christ's love. Try your best and serve Jesus Christ as your master of your home. Then 
God will bless you. And also, we need to remember that Jesus Christ, He is our number one priority. Ephesians, let me give you just one more passage and then get dismissed. Ephesians chapter 6, verse 1 through 4. Children, obey your parent in the Lord, for this is right. Honor your father and mother, which is the first commandment with promise, that, may, that it may be well with you and you may live long on the earth. And you fathers, do not provoke your children to wrath, but bring them up in the training and admission of the Lord. This is a different case but it may apply even to the relationship between husband and wife. This is what scripture says. Children, obey your parents in the Lord. Children, they must obey their parents in the Lord, within the boundary of God's commandment. But what if the parents tell their children, don't go to church, do not read the Bible, do not practice your faith. Okay? Stay home on Sunday. You are children of your parent. The scripture says that you must obey your parent. What can you do? The scripture says that you must obey your parent in the Lord. In the Lord. Only in the Lord. So as children, you have to show your respect to your parents, absolutely. You have to honor your parents in all things, except one thing, okay? In the boundary, within the boundary of God's commandment, okay? Seek his kingdom first, then everything will be added unto you. Jesus Christ is your number one priority. So God is higher than your father than your mother. He is in higher authority. Therefore, his commandment is higher than your father's or mother's commandment. Therefore, when Christians practice their faith in their Christian life, sometimes they will experience persecution. But be patient and pray to the Lord and put everything upon God's hand. You should not obey that command. When your parents say to you, do not go to church on Sunday, do not read the Bible, do not practice your faith. But everything beside that, you have to obey them because they are your parents. Same thing applies to husband and wife relationship. Wives must be submissive to the husband. But if husband said, Honey, don't go to church on Sunday, okay? I am your king. You follow me. You obey me, okay? I make decision from today. Don't go to church on Sunday. And the wife, what must she do then? What must she do? She should obey her husband? No, 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 no. Not in that case. She should not follow her husband's command. She has to go to church, practice her faith. But rest of that, she has to obey her husband. That's the teaching of the Bible. Because husband, they are in higher authority than the woman. Okay? Remember that woman was created for man. Man was created first, then woman. It means that they are in different authority. So scripture is very clear to say that the husband and, the, and that the woman, wives must be submissive to the husband. Children must be submissive to their parents. Students must be submissive to the teachers. Soldiers, they must be submissive to their commander. 
That's the order that God has set at the time of his, his creation. Because time is already uh, 9.15, uh, it's better to dismiss at this time. Okay? It is technically impossible to give all the answers to all the questions. Maybe we can uh, do that later. Okay? Let's pray together and then get dismissed. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for your wonderful love. For your salvation, we praise your name and we honor your wonderful name. Please teach us every day and every moment and guide us into the right direction through the teaching of your word. Bless us in our church fellowship so that we may stay firmly in your word into the fellowship with other Christians and serve you until the, until the day we meet you in, the, in heaven. Bless our church and our ministry. In Jesus' name we pray together. Amen. Okay, thank you.